Well, good afternoon or good morning. Whenever you're uh, taking this in, uh, this interview is the next installment in our Connecting Conversations series. For those of you that have been following along on our Facebook page, uh, New Hope Life, um, from our New Hope Free Methodist uh, Facebook page, you know that uh, we have been developing these Connecting Conversations over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we are building bridges through isolation, and uh, this is our opportunity to just take a few minutes to get to know one another and uh, learn some things that we might not otherwise learn if we don't sit down and take some time uh, to talk to folks when we see them. So right now we can't see each other physically, so we're doing and, and using this technology to do it virtually. So today uh, on the screen, uh, you can see here uh, Ben King is with us today. So hi, Ben. Hi, how's it going? Going great, going great. So thanks for joining us uh, today. I have the privilege of uh, interviewing and getting to know Ben and, and helping you get to know Ben a little bit better today. Uh, ben has been at New Hope for how long? How long have you been at New Hope now? I guess just more than a year. We became members on Easter last year, I think. So we've been members for a year and we started coming uh, around the fall before that. That's right. Okay. And uh, very quickly integrated into the life of New Hope and uh, now serves on our administrative council, which is like our local board and uh, has been instrumental in, in helping our building maintenance wise. And uh, tell us, uh, this will just be fun for people to know that we've, we've got an old building. Tell us the most recent project you were working on and, and what you found. Yeah, so our, our building on Union Street is, is very old. Part of it was built I don't know if you can help me, Scott. Like 1880s, I think. 1880s, and then what's now the sanctuary was added on later. But um, just before everything got shut down, a couple weeks before that, I was at the church um, taking a look at the exit door um, that Scott had noticed uh, some squirrel action chewing a hole in, in the outside of the building. So I pulled the sill off the door and I found out that not only was there a squirrel hole that had gone under there, but it was completely rotten underneath. And so I started taking it all apart and replacing some of the wood, but it was, it's a much bigger project to, to fix it properly. So I, I put it back together in a good enough standpoint. Uh, the door is operational for when we come back and someday we'll do a renovation over there. That's about right. Uh, it was, it was funny. I, I heard, uh, I, I'll give him the name, Sammy the Squirrel, but uh, we, we've had our fair share of squirrel issues over at the church, but uh, Sammy was determined to get in that back door, and when he couldn't get in the back door, uh, he went along the roof line and over toward the, the front uh, tower and uh, found an old place where squirrels tried to get in over there, and he was uh, working away on that one until I went outside and uh, started playing my hawk music from my phone and uh, throwing little pebbles at him, so... <laughs> So, if you guys want to know what your pastor does on a weekday uh, when the sun comes out and the weather gets warm, there you go. But uh, chase is away. Say again. You chase away the squirrels. That's right. So, and and very thankful to you though. You're a very handy guy, and you've been doing a lot of work around the building. So, tell us a little bit, Ben, about where you come from. What's uh, where where are you originally from? So I'm from Vermont. I was born and raised in a fairly small town in Vermont, um, nearby the, the big city of Burlington, which is um, not a city by any New York standards. Um, it's a wonderful place to live. I grew up on 10 acres of woods with uh, my three siblings and my parents. And um, so I played in the woods. I was home, we were all homeschooled um, up through, up until high school. Um, so I spent all the nice days outside learning um, how to dig in the mud and um, all the rainy days inside doing math homework once in a while. Nice. That's great. It served, served me pretty well. Yeah. So you like the outdoors and you like being in the woods and uh, tell me one, tell me some fa a favorite memory growing up, something that you really enjoyed. Um, so yeah, I, I did uh, lots of stuff outdoors. Um, you know, beautiful mountains in Vermont. It's, it's like the Adirondacks and that there's a lot of hiking to do. Um, so as much as, as I got to do that, that was all Boy Scouts and we did some, some long hikes and camping trips. 
so my, my dad and my brother both were involved with scouts. We did winter camping, build a, a Quincy, a, a cave and snowbank and sleep in that for a night, all that sort of thing. And, um, cool. I've done cross country skiing my whole, my whole life starting in eighth grade and then through high school and through college, I was on the uh, competitive cross country skiing team. Um, we got to go to nationals at, in college. So that was a lot of fun. That's cool. Well, that's something I didn't even know that you were on the ski team. All right. I think I might've heard you say you liked cross country skiing at one point, but not that you were actually competitive with it. So. Yeah. I spent a lot of time in high school and in college training, training for Nordic, which is a great experience. Yeah. That, that's one of the more, shall we say physically demanding sports uh, that is out there, right? It's a great sport because it's a full body workout. It's, it's low impact. It's not like running, banging on your knees, but mm-hmm. something you can do your whole life and it keeps you in shape. And it's just a lot of fun to be out in the, in the snow on a beautiful day. Yeah. Uh, I, I love myself. I love cross country skiing. I've never been, I'm just total amateur at it. I, I love, but I love when you get out there in the woods and you're kind of by yourself and it is, it's a very, it's a good physical exercise, but it's just nice to be quiet out there in nature and, and do the cross country skiing thing. So I didn't do it as much this year as I have in the past. Uh, for some reason, I was a little busier this year, but um, hopefully I'll get back to it. So, so we got a, maybe we can get a bunch of people together to go cross country skiing. I know there's a few of us that actually like to do that at the church and didn't even cross my mind that where there's more than one of us that does that. So yeah, Tanya has, has talked about, um, getting more people together as far as the church doing those sorts of outdoors things. So we'll have to make that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that would be fantastic. We definitely need to do that. So, so that's cool. So, um, so you grew up in Vermont and, and love the outdoors. Um, tell us a little bit about your transition uh, from Vermont. Where'd you go to college and, and stuff like that? Yep. So I went to Clarkson University. I'm wearing a Clarkson t-shirt there today. It, it is. Yeah. Um, as did my wife. So uh, we both were involved with University Christian Fellowship at Clarkson. I was a joint chapter between Clarkson and Potsdam State School, where um, the Crane School of Music is. So we got uh, to know each other through University. We were both leaders in that, doing small groups and that sort of thing Good. on college campuses and lots of other fun uh, activities. Um, and so... I'm two years older than my wife, Melanie. And so after I graduated, I went back to live with my family. And um, then after uh, Melanie graduated in 2018, I moved out to Rochester. Um, and that was in May and got, got work out here. Good. And, and we got married in August of 2018. And uh, as I said, then we got involved at New Hope soon after that. And so we've settled in there and we settled in in Rochester. Um, we bought a house in December, just before Christmas. We bought a house here in Chai Lai and um, we're continuing to make that our own. Now that it's warmer outside, getting to do some stuff in the backyard is a lot of fun. Yeah, I've definitely been following your pictures of landscaping and, and working out in the dirt and all that kind of stuff. You and yes, stuff. Okay. But I still went out and spent some time working on the backyard, even though I got all <laughs> snow was flying, probably too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you've uh, I know you've also done some work over at the church in terms of uh, helping us doing some landscaping over there, and you were uh, primary person involved in building that pergola that uh, people would see if they went to the building now. So. Very grateful for your hand handiwork and engineering mind and putting all of that together. So you've put a stamp already in, in a short year, year and a half at New Hope, you've put your stamp on it for sure. So so yeah, you, love, right. you like being a homeowner? I do, it's a lot of fun. I, as you said, I'm, I'm handy and I like to, to do projects. So my wife and I are already restaining the, the woodwork and uh, on the stairwell. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, there's always uh, being homeowner always a always a project to do and you know, never never a dull moment. But as long as you enjoy it, right? It's it's good. So so that's good. Um, so you and Melanie um, met. Uh, I know Melanie is from the Rochester area. Um, I actually knew for those that don't know, I actually knew Melanie when she was growing up. Um, she was uh, a part of the Bible quizzing ministry when I was 
working with youth and uh, coaching my own kids through Bible quizzing and stuff. So I knew Melanie a little before that, but uh, you guys met in college and um, decided to land in Rochester. How'd you, how'd you make that choice? What, what brought you back to Rochester? Was it just family for her or was there other, other choices? So Melanie is uh, now a grad student at U of R and that's what, what brought her to Rochester. She obviously knew of it. Her, she lives now five minutes from her parents, which is great. Um, more community and more family around. But um, she, after doing some undergrad research in optics, um, she has a, a dual degree in, or should I say two degrees, in electrical engineering and physics. Um, and she did some research uh, at Clarkson as an undergrad in an optics lab. Um, she liked that and wanted to see what, where else that could go. So she came to the uh, Institute for Optic, Optics at University of Rochester. Um, that was the best place uh, for optics. The, they've got a whole department. The only other place is Arizona, and we couldn't really imagine moving to the desert. So uh, <laughs> moving, moving back home for Melanie was, was uh, more of an option. And, and uh, yeah, I like Rochester. It's a great place to be. Okay. So tell us just briefly, how'd you end up, uh, how'd you end up at New Hope? What'd you guys, how'd you guys decide to land here? So um, Melanie grew up going to Pierce over here in Churchville, Chile, um, another free Methodist church in our conference, mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit bigger than New Hope. Yep. Um, I grew up going to a smaller church back in Vermont and um, I liked the idea of going to a smaller church. Um, so we, we took quite a bit of time um, when I was out here, when I moved out here first, going to different churches, um, trying to, to find where we'd want to plug in. We, we both you know, knew we'd, we'd want to get involved with the church and didn't know where that was going to be. Um, so we, uh, you know, Melanie, as you said, knew of New Hope. Um, she was involved with the Free Methodist land, as she says, <laughs> in the area. Um, so she knew of that and we, we tried it out and um, we got connected with you, Scott, and your small group you're hosting. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, as soon as we, we began going to that, we got to know um, the Kastners and, and a bunch of other folks and, and really connected really quickly, really deeply through those small groups. And um, that's always been, I think, one of the most valuable ways for me to connect the scripture is, is talk, talk about it, talk about ideas. And, uh, you know, that small group was, was, uh, a group that really liked to talk about deep theology and go off and talk about some, some other topics that were on our minds and lots, lots of history, lots of theology, lots of Bible. Yeah. We, we didn't lack for things to talk about. So, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And so, you know, that, Small group has always been a, a really valuable thing to me, like I said, in, in college, getting involved with the InterVarsity small groups um, was was the first time that I'd had really the what I was looking for um, in, a, in a faith community where we'd have real discussions about, you know, what scripture really means for our lives. Um, and um, I think InterVarsity is a great organization, non-denominational organization that, that connects people from different faith backgrounds and no faith background whatsoever um, and and gives them opportunities to to evangelize on campus and and connect with a really good community. So when we did that at, at New Hope, we were really glad to get involved with those small groups. And, and now Melanie, along with Anne, one of the other small group members from that original group we joined, um, they're both leading that ministry our, our new hope small group ministry um because they both felt it was so valuable yeah they they definitely are gifted and, and have a passion for that uh, small group ministry and so grateful for their leadership in in all of that right now so so you, you uh mentioned i think that you grew up in the church right yep uh, i grew up uh, um uh, congregational church what um tell us just a little bit about maybe when you felt like your faith became your own what was that journey like i have one of those um grew up in the church testimonies where yeah. I, I remember sometime in in sunday school 
um, becoming a Christian, saying the prayer sort of thing. But, you know, if, if I was six or eight, whatever that meant to me at the time is obviously different than, than my faith now. So I think it's one of those things where over time, as you, as you grow and mature and have different experiences, your faith becomes something different and, and means more to you. Um, so I think um, I was involved with youth group all through um, middle school and high school. And um, that was, you know, valuable. It was a, it was a mix of, um, you know, just a social group and, and some things that were pretty impactful. Mm-hmm. But I think I think when I went off to college, you know, you um, you take this step of going out on your own, and it forces you to to either um, embrace your faith for your own, or or walk away from it at, for a time, as some people do. Um, I, I did get involved with the church and like I said, university in, in Potsdam or out to school. And, um, you know, I, 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 uh, had some ups and downs, had some, some more and less, uh, admirable, um, you know, college experiences, college experiences, <laughs> you know, freshman boys are pretty dumb but, uh, I'd love to hear a story but you know, <laughs> but they might not be suitable for for airing right yeah I mean most of them were but but uh, mostly just just you know a lot of a lot of new experiences and learning um, but I think I had to yeah just make my own way as far as figuring out what it meant for me and and what was important and um i think university really really stretched me and grew me um because uh, i was asked to be a leader in that club and um i think whenever you're you're stretched and grown and asked to be a leader you're like i don't really i don't really belong here i don't think i uh i'm really you know a, a good enough Christian to be a leader here, but I've been asked to, and I think it will be valuable, so I'll do it. But you never really feel qualified, I don't think. Right. Um, so I uh, I was involved in that, and there were a lot of really good um, good community and good mentors, and and uh, I think that really grew my faith a lot. Yeah, you uh, you play the guitar. You like to play guitar, so. Sure, that's one of the reasons you got roped into to some leadership is... Uh, yeah, I was doing the worship team uh, in university as, as well. Mm-hmm. Which uh, we recognized at New Hope pretty quickly. So we have also roped you into uh, leading worship and your wife uh, loves to sing and sings beautifully. So you guys have been welcome additions to the New Hope worship team as well. So. so that's a beautiful thing. I, you said, you know, you went through some ups and downs and uh, I know... Our stories, we have we have a similar, uh, we have some things that unite us, bond us a little bit. And I just wonder, if you could talk about how your faith has kind of helped you through some of those um, struggles in life. How you know how have you leaned into faith when it's not been easy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I I think um, right, Scott. As you know, my my mom died of cancer um uh, a year before i got married or so um while i was living at home so like i said i i moved home after college uh that wasn't just because um i wanted to live at home but um my mom was very sick um she had a brain tumor um i think it was my, i guess it was my senior year she had a seizure we don't know why um it turned out it was a, a brain tumor and um then uh, when i graduated she uh, had a, a fairly paralyzed hand at that point from the nerve damage from that. So um, a struggle with a, a brain tumor is um, you just slowly went downhill. Yeah. And so she was able to 
still get around and do what she was doing. Um, you know, she was uh, a huge personality, a person everyone loved in the community. She was, she was like wildly excited about our community in Vermont, our little town, Jericho. Um, she ran the farmer's market. Um, she, she uh, loved town meeting in Vermont. They have an annual town meeting, which is, you know, direct democracy. Everyone gets to talk and decide how much salt go, gets put on the roads and what the budget for the library is and all this stuff. That's so she would always uh, drag us all along and, you know, that was part of homeschooling was direct democracy. And uh, mm -hmm. both of my sisters who, who still live there are, are now very involved. My sister took over the farmer's market um, yeah. running that. Um, so so um, she went slowly downhill in the couple of years that I was home. And uh, you just can't even explain what that's like. My, uh, you know, she had a second seizure uh, at some point, and then her, her one leg was pretty paralyzed after that. And, um, you know, her, her emotions and mental abilities went downhill. And seeing your, your mom disappear before she's gone is, is so hard. And I think when she died, it wasn't it wasn't like she suddenly was gone. Um, you know, my mom was not there anymore at the time, the time she died. So it was a, a really painful struggle for our family. Um, and, you know, I think, I think as far as my faith goes, she she was one of those people who had such a uh an honest faith she she wasn't um somebody who who made sure she had the perfect looking christian life she just lived um with enthusiasm and honesty and really loved people and um so you know the impact she had on our community and in our church um, obviously had a huge impact on me and um, what, what I believe is important and all those sorts of things. Um, but, but just struggling through that uh, with my family and then uh, when she died, it, it just so happened that that's when, you know, Melanie, was graduating and then I moved out here and um, you know it feels like that's a different world you know that that whole struggle and and that whole really rough time in, in our family's life um, and so I think It didn't, it, it, it's interesting that I wouldn't say it tested my faith and that I didn't, I didn't feel angry with God. Oh, why would you do this? I just, I just feel like, you know, life sucks sometimes. Mm -hmm. Death sucks. We all know death sucks. And, and the, and from a Christian perspective, we know that we have, we have a hope that, um, you know, that's not the end and, and the pain we experience here, we don't have to experience after we die and and so just that hope at her funeral you know having a a big ex, a big wonderful worship time at her funeral she she had few requests but one of them was that she had the brass band play um on the way from the church to the graveyard and uh they did that that's nice. it was it was a procession right right through the town and um that's beautiful it was a, a very impactful thing for people i think and um so really i think that struggle was a dark time in my life but i think the the impact that my mom had on me is way bigger than that yeah. you know i've been um reading the stories and and 
studying Martin Luther, the, the theologian from the 16th century, and, you know, he wrote a lot about um, the hope, you know, that we have in Christ because of Christ's finished work on the cross. And where I'm going with this is, uh, you know, he, he used to, as a pastor, counsel people who lost loved ones or even his own family, his own mom, when, when she was going through death uh, and that sort of a thing. And he used to just counsel her, you know, like we have this hope and, and, and it was almost a cerebral intellectual thing for him. Like, why, why would you even be discouraged? You have Christ. So, you know, you'll be in heaven, like it's going to be better. And, and, and then he writes about how when he actually became a father, um, he ended up having six kids and two of his kids died at very early ages. Uh, mm -hmm. One died when they were uh, like an infant and another one when she was like 13 years old. And it radically changed his perspective on humanity and our ability to process and, and cope. And, you know, in, in the one sense, it's, it just reminded me of what you're describing, you know, of like it doesn't it didn't really change his belief in God but it does bring it home, right? It, it makes it more real and fundamentally um, kind of brings it back to the, the human, our humanity. We're, we're still human. We still feel things. It's still hard. And so I, I commend you on going through that journey. And, and you and I have shared some stories of, I shared my own personal story of losing my mom in a similar way. And I shared that in a different conversation from last week. So anybody can go back and read a hear about that too so so I get it you know it's, it's one of the few times you know I'm not told as a pastor that I'm supposed to say I get it right because I don't I don't get everybody's story but in some cases I really do and uh, so my heart goes out to you and, and I know that's been a, a hard a hard journey for you so I yeah appreciate you know, you. yeah you know our, our wedding was the hardest the hardest time mm. for sure you know going through those life events without without your parent who you just lost yeah. was one of the toughest yeah. and uh, you know that that's that uh reality of the pain of of death and separation but but like you said i think that the hope that we have was solidified for me mm -hmm. um, just I, I can't imagine you know if, if she was not a christian and i didn't have the confidence that she um, is is with Jesus, and that I'm going to see her again. You know, it would be a very different experience. Yeah, it would, and it and it really it changes the changes the outlook, changes our whole perspective. Um, doesn't take away the pain, right? But it changes right. the perspective on on what the the future looks like uh, through the pain. So, well, I appreciate you being vulnerable there and sharing a little bit about that that story. Um, so, tell us a little bit about where you work. Uh, let's kind of shift gears here for a second. And uh, where do you work these days? So, as I said, I moved out here in, in May, so just about two years ago, um, and uh, I started working at Lachey's Construction. So I'm a, a project engineer there, which means I, I work on a lot of the technical paperwork to get everything um, in line and in order to, to build a building. So LaChase builds a lot of commercial um, hospitals, uh, higher ed, that sort of thing in Rochester. And we have offices around New York and, and now in the Carolinas as well. But um, Rochester is where that company started. So LaChase is a, is a pretty well-known name around here. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of fun, I think, um, to, to have you know, LaChase's name up on on the side of RGH and a lot of other big high profile projects in Rochester and, and know that you're part of that. Um, I'm part of a big project on the other side of the town, um, been doing a big manufacturing expansion. So um, being part of, of what's going on in Rochester is, is fun. It, it makes me feel involved in, and part of, of Rochester now. Um, so I, I like that work a lot. Unfortunately, I can't be on the job site anymore because I'm working from home. Right. I'm thankful I can work from home. We have the technology. Uh, my job is mostly emails and phone calls and now Zoom meetings. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, you know this format too well, right? <laughs> know it very well. Um, usually it's with uh, eight, five or eight people who are not very good with technology, <laughs> some of them. Is my or, you know, on? Can you see me? <laughs> sometimes they don't know their videos on. Um, yep. But uh, we're able to, to really do the coordination work um, remotely. And uh, as you may know, uh, Rock, uh, New York State has deemed certain construction projects essential, mm -hmm. uh, including the, the one I'm part of. So they, they were on pause for a week or two, and uh, then we got uh, the approval to be up and running. So with the precautions in place for the pandemic, um, staying socially distant, lots of sanitization, um, La Chase has, has made a way to continue the construction work we're trying to do in many cases, not all, but many cases, um, we're able to continue that work safely. And uh, um, another thing I'm very proud of working for La Chase is that they take safety very seriously. Um, you know, the construction industry is known for being very dangerous. And it's really just because it's accepted that it's dangerous. And if you just don't accept that, you can change the mindset. And that's the way La Chase thinks about it. So um, it's great to be part of that. Uh, uh, a company who's kind of pushing the envelope among the the um, construction companies to to really make sure everyone goes home safe every day. So that continues into the pandemic and and they're taking the precautions they need to. But there are guys on site working at this point. Um, they're working very hard to to put a lot of work in place that was uh, already a tight schedule. So. No, I really appreciate that. And and there was a time when I worked uh, in the public sector and um, La Chase was one of the few construction companies, you know, with that really good reputation. There's there's a handful of them, um, but uh, La Chase is ranked right up there consistently for both quality and, you know, professionalism and safety and, and all those criteria. So you're working for a good company, as far as I know, and uh, certainly uh, I think it's true. So it's good. It's good. Yeah. So. How are you and Melanie coping with uh, with COVID isolation? Pretty well overall. Um, you know, we're trying to, to get outside and at least go for a walk every day because otherwise you don't get out of the house at all. Um, we're both, we both feel very grateful that we're able to work from home. We still have our paychecks coming in. Um, you know, she, as I said, is a grad student and she can do her, uh, her TAing class she's, she's helping to teach and also the class she's taking both virtually online okay. uh, and uh, as well as continue to do her research which was all you know um, it wasn't physical lab bench she needed to do her, her research so she's continuing that um, and I'm working from home as we were discussing before this call uh, I'm pretty swamped with work right now like I said there's a very tight schedule for the project as it always seems is the case Right. Um, Feast but, famine, that's the way it works, right? You... Yeah, yeah. So right now uh, we're at the point where the outside shell of the building is is up and they're ready, ready to start putting all the piping in, all of the walls on the inside, uh, put the skin on the outside and um, everyone's getting all of their submittals in. So that means that every product they're going to use, every type of pipe and fitting and pump and wall part and door and window all has to be sent to me so i can send it to the architect or engineer so they can say yes this meets our specification no it doesn't wow uh so that's that's what we as a construction manager do is we we are the the coordinator who makes it all come together um it sounds like you're also a bit of quality control there too right Yep. So literally there's a lot of quality control, you know, not only do we get all the paperwork done, but then we make sure that as it's built, we have the inspectors, you know, do the quality control. We make sure it's all going together, right? All the folks are talking to one another and it's all going to work together. The owner is going to have a good product when we're done. So it's a lot of fun. So anybody that's out there that drives by RGH and sees all that building project over there, now you know somebody who's actually behind the scenes making it all come together. So that's that's the neighboring project of mine. Um, I'm actually at Bausch and Lomb, which is right down the road. Oh, okay, okay. 
So there's two pretty big projects um, going on right over there with the Chase both of those because obviously the hospital is essential. Okay, got it. All right, well, that's good clarification. So now, so people know that, but, um, well, this I, has been- It's one of the most high profile jobs. Right. Um, you see the, the big facade with the big logos on it. Well, and, and especially right now, given, you know, hospitals and, and how in demand they are. So I think everybody's paying attention to all of that. So what's well, interesting, we had Eric Gaspar on here the other day, and he actually works for, uh, I interviewed him, he works for Klein Steel. So uh, now we have a couple of different angles, I'm sure, in which some of these projects are coming together. So yeah, uh, you spoke to Camila before that, she works for uh, the architecture firm. So we could uh, have our own little uh, industry. <laughs> In the church that's right that is true so. and we did you know Camille was a part of that pergola project you referenced and I I helped to coordinate it because that's my yep. my wheelhouse so yeah no that that's fantastic yeah that's true I, I didn't even make put that dot together but uh, yeah we got a lot of folks uh, working in that field and and pulling things together so I know one of the things that uh, there's just there's so many projects we still have yet to do over at the church but um, it's, uh, one of these days we'll actually be get get back there and start. We'll get there some. Yeah. But uh, yeah, while we're while we're stuck at home, um, like I said, I'm, I'm working a lot and it's it's stressful. But um, like I said, I'm getting outside as much as I can now that it's starting to get warmer or it's snowing. <laughs> but it whatever. Was. It was a couple of days ago, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, we have cats. My wife was, was very excited to get cats when she had a house. Um, so we got those right at Christmas time. Um, I think, and I think you have two of the best cat names ever. So why don't you share what your cat names are? We have an orange cat, Ember, and a black and white brown or gray cat, Smoke. There you go. We have, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. <laughs> um, and they're cute. They, they really do love each other. and. Yeah. They came from the shelter together and they were already ad adoptive brothers. Mm. So cuddle all the time yeah. when they're on the couch, they tussle and bite each other's faces while they're feisty. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It keeps us a little entertained while we're, while we're in the house. That's great. Well, that's fantastic. Well, Ben, this has been great. I appreciate the time you've taken and, and given to everybody here to get to know you. Um, is there any last thing you'd like to say to some, you know, just uh, one thing that we might not guess or know about you, or maybe it's a favorite Bible verse, or I don't know, just one last parting thought for everybody? One last tidbit. I don't know. I think we, we talked about, you know, outdoorsy and, mm -hmm. and what I'm doing in the church. Um, Who's I your don't know. Who's your favorite guitarist? Who do you who do you try to pattern your guitar after? Well, that's interesting because the, the kind of music I play on guitar is not the kind of music I listen to. I listen to rap music mostly. Um, there's a lot of great Christian hip hop artists, so there's there's your tidbit. I listen to rap. <laughs> when I tell people at work that they're like, What? There you go. So I, I like a lot of hip hop. You know, Lecrae is the one of the most famous ones, but there's a lot others on his uh, um his company reach records and, and lots of other um cool artists who who are are christians who who make really good rap music so yeah i know nf is one of your guys right so yeah yeah your your boys like him too yeah we we have that going a lot in our house so and uh and again just another reference to eric's uh, eric Gaspar's interview he's a he's big into rap as well so that was one of the things I learned about him. So, yeah, I don't think too many people would guess that about you, you know, seeing you play an acoustic guitar on Sundays and stuff like yeah. that. So, so that's fun. That's fun. I'll have to share some stories about what music to listen to. So, well, yeah, Ben, I appreciate I it. All the kinds of music. We were listening to Taylor Swift and watching her her uh, documentary the other day, and there's not a lot that I won't listen to. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Uh, I, that describes our house, I think, more than anything. We, there's not a lot, but um, I will say if my boys saw Taylor Swift on the, the TV, they would be huddled around it together. That's for sure. So, so they'd, for whatever reason. Anyway, <laughs> you can ask me about that later, folks. If you have any comments uh, or questions for Ben, leave them in the comments. Uh, 
He'd love to dialogue and feedback with you. Uh, we'll try to connect with you a little bit more and uh, just reach out, get to know Ben a little bit more. This has been uh, pretty in-depth and, and great. And I, uh, again, just thank you, Ben, for taking the time to meet with us tonight. Glad to do it. Thanks. All righty. So, everybody, uh, tune in. Uh, we'll keep doing these over the next uh, several weeks. Uh, we'll see how long we can keep them going. Um, but uh, thanks for tuning in, and have a great rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.